I'm retired from my job as a high school history teacher, so I have plenty of time to pursue my passion, discovering forgotten tombstones in Old West ghost towns. I usually take my husband Drew on these trips. We travel rough, sometimes not showering for several days. To maintain my womanly aplomb, I use judicious amounts of Chanel No. 5, the scent I wore on our wedding day. We explore isolated, windswept pioneer cemeteries in the abandoned little towns of Oregon, Montana, Nevada, and other corners of the West. Every burial ground has its own aura. You can almost feel the passage of time and the loneliness of eternity all around you. When you're roaming the weed-strewn lots, you feel removed from everyone and everything. It's almost like you're nothing more than a blade of prairie grass that will soon blow away on the incessant wind. On my last trip to an old gold rush town, though, I went alone. After so much forced togetherness, I guess I needed a little me time. Wandering at will, free as a bird, I discovered a tiny cemetery that looked like it had been neglected for decades. Many of the tombstones were knocked down, wildflowers and blackberry bushes nearly obscured the graves. I began exploring the site, focusing on the tombstones and their barely visible etchings. Most of the inhabitants had lived and died in the late 1800s or early 1900s. I wandered among the granite stones, wondering about the individuals below and what they had done during their previous time above Earth. It was very peaceful, until I came upon a site that took my breath away and made me shake with fear. At my feet, lay a crumbling tombstone, and it had my name on it. I sank to my knees, my heart hammered against my chest, I thought I was going crazy or having a stroke. You see, the names chiseled on that tombstone were my first, last, and the nickname my parents had given me as a newborn because I had such ruddy cheeks. My parents, who were born in Russia and moved to New York before I was born, had called me Little Borscht. Since I was an only child, no one else knew the endearment or called me that, yet it was etched on an old tombstone. The person allegedly buried below, with my very own name, had been born in 1895 and died in 1904, a child of nine. We shared the same day of birth, May 17th, but I was born 60 years after the original little Borsch, and of course I was very much alive. Then I recalled, at the age of nine, I was very sick with a bacterial infection. My parents later told me that they thought I might die. In the hospital, I'd had a fevered vision of a pretty young girl with long braids and a black dress. I'd told my mother, and she said it was probably due to my illness. After my recuperation at home, I forgot about my hospital vision. Until now. Who was this little Borsch lying six feet below me? How was I related to her, if at all? Perhaps because she did not mature into adulthood, I was living the life she would have lived, but how could I find out? When I returned home after discovering my own grave, everything seemed subtly different. Although I kept my secret to myself, perhaps I gave off troubling vibes. My friends started canceling lunch dates and even my husband, Drew, looked at me oddly. It was almost like I gave off the rank odor of mold or sour milk. Nobody wanted to be around me, and I admit I wasn't good company. I was too preoccupied to do much more than nod in agreement when Drew asked if I wanted fish sticks or frozen hamburgers for dinner. He's the chef in our house. Whenever possible, I retreated to our basement office and began googling for clues about the first little borscht. I found nothing, who she was, if she was ever connected to me, or if my life had replaced her own, it was all as elusive as ever. Although my parents were long deceased, I contacted relatives to see if they could help with all the painful questions. The answers were always negative. What to do? In bed one night, as Drew drifted off to sleep snoring gently, I started to feel desperate and panicky. I knew I had to go back to that cemetery where Little Borsch had been buried, more than 100 years earlier. Yet to solve the mystery of the first Little Borsch, I would need to dig up her grave. 
and take in all the clues that emerged. From there, I might learn the true story of our intertwining histories. This was my mission, and I knew I would fulfill it. The next morning, I told Drew I was making a quick trip to the grocery store. Instead, I bought what I needed for my secret undertaking. I tried not to feel guilty about my little white lie, but my real plans would not have gone over well with Drew. A week later, I found myself at the old cemetery and quickly located little Borscht's grave. I breathed a sigh of relief. The site was untouched. The winds had died down, but the air was humid, and there were dark, threatening clouds above. Lightning flashed on the horizon. It felt like, at any moment, the deluge could come. I brought along a few simple tools to help me excavate, but was too agitated to get to work. I stood, glued to the spot, gazing around and wondering if I was being observed. The cemetery was terribly isolated. If an interloper happened by, I planned on saying I was an archaeologist on a dig. Actually, that was 99% true. Finally, I gave myself a pep talk, grabbed a shovel, and began chipping away at the hard, weedy dirt. I worked silent and steadily for 40 minutes or so, making good progress. After digging several feet down, I paused to wet my face, breathing deeply and sweating through my shirt. Suddenly, I noticed a strong odor emanating from the ground beneath my feet. I peered down to see an ancient wooden casket, now partially exposed. But the familiar smell wasn't that of death and decay, to be certain. I fell to my knees and inhaled. Indeed, it was the feminine, romantic scent of Chanel No. 5, the only perfume I've ever worn. How on earth was this wafting up from a casket that held the bones of the original little Borsch? Then, as a bolt of lightning struck not a hundred yards away, came the most disturbing thought of all. When little Borscht died, Chanel No. 5 had not yet been created.